In your Bible today, the book of John, John chapter 9, if you would turn there with me. John chapter 9. Now, here's what's happening here in terms of this series of messages. Easter is coming. It's not too far away. What about six, seven weeks away? And I'm preaching a message, a series of messages to lead up to Easter because I just think it's... uh, It is absolutely essential. You just focus entirely upon the person and work of Christ as you approach the Easter season. And uh, my fondest dream, my greatest vision for our church is that our people would really take seriously the claims of Jesus Christ, that they would apply them in their lives that they would more than anything seek to be like the Lord Jesus, that they would seek Christ-likeness in their their personal life. I hope you take that with the seriousness that it ought to be taken. The reason the Lord saved you was not so you could just come to church on Sunday and live a good moral life. He saved you because he needs representatives in the world where when people go to work or when they do business or when they go to school, that they look around and there's somebody who looks an awful lot like Jesus Christ. And that's my challenge personally, and that is your challenge as well. So we're talking here this month and for a few weeks about Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. And today, the subject is Jesus is the answer to men's darkness. We talked about Jesus is the answer to men's disappointment. He turned the water into wine. A very disappointed group of people saw his power. And then Jesus is the answer to doubt because a nobleman came half doubting and half believing that Jesus could heal his son. And from 20 miles distant, Jesus Christ healed his boy, with just a word. Jesus is the answer then to our desires. And a multitude of people had nothing to eat, and they've been with the Lord now for more than a day. And Jesus, as you know, multiplied matter. He multiplied the fishes and the bread, and so he met the answer. He is the answer to desire, to hunger. And now today we're talking about Jesus is the answer to darkness. And the passage is John chapter 9. Stand with me as we read God's Word together, if you will, please. Chapter 9 and verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, and read it with me aloud, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, And he made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which were before had seen him, which before had seen him, that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. And therefore said they unto him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay, or we would say mud. And he anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and I washed, and I received my sight. Jesus is the answer to darkness. Then said they unto him, Where is he? And he said, I know not. 
I don't know. Thank you, and you may be seated. In the last part of the book of John, the apostle John said that Jesus wrought many other miracles which are not recorded here in the book of John, but these are written, these miracles or these supernatural signs were written so that people might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The purpose of the miracles was not first to help an individual, though they were for that purpose, but the primary purpose of the miracles, John said, was that people might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so John selected seven miracles and seven only. Jesus Christ performed miracles every day of his ministry, I believe. He performed thousands, maybe tens of thousands of miracles. I don't know. John says so many it would be like the world could not even contain the total. But John only selected seven. And he said, of those seven, if you will analyze these and study these, these are written that you could be convinced that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of the living God. So I've studied a lot about miracles, more than maybe I ever have in the last few weeks. And I've become very interested in them because, very frankly, I've told you in times past that I went through a period of real doubt about whether I believed the Bible being absolutely true, whether I could accept everything in the Bible, though I was raised in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. But even though I went to Bible colleges, Even with all that background, I mean, the devil got on my case when I was in college at the University of South Carolina. And I had a couple of professors. They just about messed me up. And I had doubts, and the greatest point of my doubt was miracles. Did I really believe that God could open up the sea and people could walk through on on solid ground? Did I believe that Jesus Christ could take a little boy's lunch and feed 5,000 men, not including the women and children? And some of those miracles just, it really created a sense of doubt. And so I've enjoyed personally preparing this series because, again, it's given me some insights that, very frankly, in preaching on this all these years, I still hadn't discovered some of those things. And I hope you will really listen today. The Bible records exactly 200 miracles from the beginning of Genesis right on through the end of the Bible. It begins with a miracle. God created the heaven and the earth, the universe, matter and energy, and he did it with a spoken word. He spoke, and it was so. Let me tell you what a lot of Christians don't think about, though. Miracles are essential to the Christian faith. You take the miracles out of the Bible, you no longer have Christianity. It is essential that I believe in miracles to believe in the Christian faith. People who are very rationalistic sometimes want to eliminate all the supernatural from the Bible, and they they still say, I'm a Christian. If you take the supernatural out of the Bible, all you have is an ethical moral system. Now, that's good. It'll teach you how to live right, even if you took the miracles out. But it is not the Christian faith that will save your soul and take you to heaven when you die. I promise you that. There's a vast difference. And so, miracles are essential to the Christian faith. There are three miracles that above all the other miracles, Satan has attacked through the centuries. The first one, of course, is creation. He's attacking it every day in the universities and even in our secondary schools. And secular education is based, the foundation of secular education today in America is a belief in evolutionary theory, which eliminates God from the equation. And then the second thing that Satan has always attacked is the incarnation, the idea that God became a man through the Lord Jesus Christ, that in the miracle of the virgin birth, God came into the human family, and he lived in existence on the earth, and that God became human flesh. 
And then the third miracle that Satan has always attacked has been the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All, it's been rationalized and attempted by many to, they attempted to explain it away, but uh, the resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, Paul said, we are of all men most miserable because we don't have any basis, no foundation for our Christian faith. And so those three miracles are daily attacked by Satan across the world, and yet there's plenty of evidence that miracles, in fact, existed in the Bible. Now, here's the key thing. The way that you look at miracles in the Bible is determined by your worldview. We talk a lot about worldview, worldview being the the glasses that you put on to interpret life, that I look through a certain worldview and I interpret everything in the light of that worldview. And there's two basic worldviews that as a Christian living in 2019, you really need, you better understand, or your faith can get shaken today. And so today, hopefully I'll be able to help you strengthen your worldview. The way you look at miracles is totally determined by how you look at life, your worldview. So I brought my, I actually took a pair of my wife's shoes out of this and brought it with me today, so uh, thank you, Norman. This little box represents, I want you in your mind to think of this box as being the entire universe. I mean, everything that is, is in this box, okay? So I look down in this box, and I see earth over here, a tiny little dot, And then I see the solar system extending out from there. And then I see our galaxy extending from there. And then I see other galaxies, the infinity of space. And way out here from Earth, as far as you can get, here are galaxies that are undiscovered. We're talking about millions of light years, a light year being the amount of distance a beam of light travels in a year, millions and millions of light years out here somewhere, there's still the solar system. How far does it go? Scientists don't know. It's infinite today. Everything that is, all energy, all matter, all life, all everything that is anything, every part of existence, there's not a molecule that exists. It's not in my box, okay? Now, a secularist, or naturalism is probably the best word to use for a worldview. Naturalism looks at the universe like I'm looking at this box. It's got a top on it. It's a closed system. And by a closed system, here's what I mean. Everything that is in the entire universe, billions of light years away, everything that is is in the box. And everything in that box operates by natural law, forces that we call nature, natural law, gravity, magnetism, all the different forces, chemical, electronic, every force that you can imagine, it's all in the box. And there's nothing outside the box, so there's no God. And so everything operates according to natural law. Now, if you believe, if you have a naturalistic worldview, then that satisfies you. And you read about the miracles in the Bible, and you think this. Well, that couldn't happen. That couldn't happen. Those miracles didn't happen because everything that is is in the box. It's in the universe, and it, the universe operates purely by natural law. That's naturalism. I hope we don't have a naturalist in the building, or I hope there's not even one watching television, but sheer force of numbers today, I would say that we do. We have many. And if you go to a secular university, this is the view you will be taught. And this is the thing that is happening to our children. They buy into this because it is a very logical explanation if you accept the assumptions and the presuppositions that they begin with. Now, 
There's another worldview. It's my worldview. It is the biblical worldview. It's the Christian worldview. And it's called theism. Theism. So you have naturalism and you have theism. And what is theism? Well, we say here's everything in the box. There's the universe. But it's not closed. There's not a top on it. The top is removed and there are forces outside the box. The forces being, here's God. Theism says theistic God. There's a God and he transcends this. In fact, he made everything in the box. There's nothing in the box that wasn't created by him. And he is the one who created the laws that govern this most of the time. But occasionally, God decides he wants to override or supersede or bypass some of his own laws. Well, he has the right to do that, doesn't he? And so when he does, he creates a miracle, we call it. The God who transcends and controls the universe, he intervenes in the universe. It's an open system. God can do as he wishes because he, in fact, created it. It's his. It all belongs to him. He could destroy it. He can keep it. He can do whatever he wishes. I'm a theist. There's a God. And he occasionally comes. In fact, that's the definition of a miracle. A miracle is a supernatural act where God decides to intervene in some earthly event or some situation. He temporarily suspends part of his natural laws. He bypasses them. He overcomes them. He supersedes them, whatever words you want to use. He overcomes and supersedes the laws of nature, and he intervenes on behalf of someone or something. And so, let's go to John chapter 9 and verse 1. Jesus passed by. That's an important phrase. In the normal course of life, Jesus Christ is walking through the streets of Jerusalem, and there's a blind man sitting over here who is, in fact, begging. He's been there for years. He's been there because the Bible makes the point he's been blind from his birth. Jesus didn't stage this event like uh, some magician. Who is that fellow you see on TV? Uh, Copperfield, is that his name? David Copperfield. Well, he does these tricks and People are astounded about what he does, but it takes him days to set up all the staging and the equipment. You know you're going to be, you know it's a sleight of hand thing. Well, Jesus didn't set up his equipment for four or five days. Jesus is walking by the normal course of life. And as he walks by, he sees this man. And one of the disciples say something to him. Is he there blind and begging because uh, he sinned or did somebody else sin and cause this. And Jesus said, neither. You can't, all, all, all uh, disease, of course, indirectly comes from, from sin, but you don't, it's not always a specific sin. It's that we inherited a broken body and a broken nature. It's not somebody's specific sin. Usually it might be. So Jesus looked at the man and he had pity on him. The man didn't even ask for help, if you will notice. The man didn't even speak to Jesus. In fact, the man's blind. He probably is not even aware that Jesus of who Jesus is. And what does Jesus do? He just det- determines to intervene. And so how does he intervene? He, th- th- this, this is a little strange to us, but he, he spits on the ground. And he stirs it up a little bit, and he anoints the man's eyes, and he says to him, Now go wash over here at the Pool of Siloam, which is not very far away. And the man did that. The man was just foolish enough to believe Jesus Christ. (laughs) And when he did, he came back. What's the word at the end of that verse? Seeing. He came back seeing. He had not seen one gleam of light since his childhood. And so Jesus' method here spit on the ground, make a little clay, anoint the man's eyes, the man washed, and he's healed. That's a miracle. 
You see, that superseded the laws of nature. I don't know what laws of nature are involved. Did the man have some sort of problem with his retina or his optic nerve or the pupil or cataracts? Or, I don't know what was wrong. We don't need to know. We know this, that God made the human eye. And we know that God has the power to do what he wishes with my eye, your eye, or this man's eye. And that Jesus Christ reversed whatever was wrong physically, and the man gained his sight that day. There, he was healed instantaneously. It wasn't a progressive thing where he had to keep coming back for more. He was healed completely, 100%. My guess is he had 20 20 vision or maybe better. He was healed permanently. He didn't have to worry about the condition returning because he had been healed by the greatest physician who ever lived, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who does all things well, the Bible said. I read a story about Ray Charles, the singer, his manager. The manager said one day he needed to go in. They had adjoining hotel rooms and he went over and he needed to say something to Ray Charles, the singer, and he knocked on the door. And he said, Ray Charles came to the door and opened his door, and the blinds were drawn and no lights were on. It was completely dark, and he was shaving. There was shaving soap on his face. And the man said, Ray, you're shaving in the dark? And Ray Charles said to him, man, where I am, it's always dark. It's always dark. Well, there's a lot of people where they are. It's always dark. They, don't, they have not met the light, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus used the physical, this case, in this case, healing this man's blindness. He used the physical to illustrate the spiritual. Now, that blind man Write a little note in your Bible. He represents the condition of every single person outside of Jesus Christ. If you are not saved, if you haven't been born again by the Holy Spirit, if the Lord Jesus, His Spirit doesn't live in your heart, you're like that blind man. The Bible says you are in darkness. That's the way the Bible, darkness is the description the Bible uses of people outside of Christ. So when Jesus performed this miracle, he was using the physical to illustrate and demonstrate the spiritual. This man represents every single lost person on the planet today. Some are totally blind. Some of them have a little bit of sight, but they don't have very much sight. They are living in the darkness. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 4, listen to this. Don't turn there. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. The God of this world hath blinded the minds, not the eyes physically, but the minds of them that believe not. The God of this world, that would be Satan, wouldn't it? Satan has blinded the minds. Listen, it would be terrible to be blind in your eyes like Ray Charles was, but he had a good mind. What would be 10,000 times worse would be to be blind in your mind. And the God of this world has blinded the minds, the thinking processes of the people of this world who have rejected Jesus Christ, who live in that closed system where they don't believe God has anything to do with life at all. Not only does the Bible say we're our, that Satan has blinded our minds, but in 1 Peter 2 and 9, it describes the loss like this. He has called you out of darkness into light. What is a Christian? A Christian is a person who one time was blind, but has been called out of that darkness and into the glorious light of our Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian can say, spiritually, I can see. I can see. Not because of my efforts, 
but I can see because Jesus, the light of the world, has shed his wondrous light upon me and given me my sight. In Chicago, Illinois, there's a bypass or overpass over a very, very busy freeway. And somebody got up there, and with graffiti, they scrawled on the overpass above that very busy thoroughfare there. They wrote, Jesus is the answer. And so some wag came along and took a paintbrush and not to be out down and said, well, what is the question? Jesus is the answer. And somebody said, well, but what is the question? Pretty good question, huh? Well, I can answer that. The question is this, what is the answer to men's darkness? What is the answer to men's darkness today? It's Jesus Christ. What is the answer to men's doubt? It's Jesus Christ. Tonight, I'm going to take another miracle. What is the answer to man's despair, his fear, his apprehension and anxiety? Answer, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. Well, what is the answer to? He is the answer to the problems that darkness and sin have brought to this universe. In verse 5, Jesus claims to be the light of the world. Chapter 9, verse 5, I am the light of the world. That's the second time he said it. Flip back one page in your Bible to chapter 8 and uh, verse number 12. And Jesus said again unto them, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So Jesus has already introduced this idea that he is the light of the world. And now, this is a continuation of that same discussion that he had back in chapter 8. It's been going on for many verses here. So Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. In claiming that, what was Jesus saying? He said, I am the answer to darkness. Well, he really was. You ask that old boy that day, that fellow, the beggar, go down to chapter 9 now, verse number 24. Verse 23. And the parents said to the Pharisees who were trying to question this man now and find out what was going on, they said, he is of age, ask him. And then again call they the man that was blind. Now the they is the Pharisees, the religious leaders who are opposing Jesus. And they said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus. And what did this old boy say? He said, he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. But one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I can see. Amen to that, huh? You may not be able to explain the whole thing about every detail of theology or how to know God, but I'll tell you one thing. If you've ever lived in the dark, you know it when you get in the light, don't you? I remember when Sammy came. Sammy, excuse me, but he was a mess. He was a pure mess when he walked in the door here. And you know what? He saw the light, and he told you about it and what God's done in his life. Now, that's what the church is about, ladies and gentlemen. That's what the faith is about. That's why I'm standing here shouting at you, because I want you to wake up, and I want you to really believe from the bottom of your socks to the top of your head, Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the only answer in this world today. That man's testimony, I don't, I don't know what he is, but I know one thing, I was blind, <laughs> and now I can see. But when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, he was describing his own nature. His nature is that of light as opposed to darkness. In fact, go with me to the first chapter of John. We haven't turned much here, and I want you to use your Bible, make it worth you bringing it. John chapter 1, and verse number 4, in the prologue to this book, before he gets started well, here's here's what John says, in him, Jesus, the Word, capital W, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light 
shineth in the darkness. Jesus came into a dark world then, and the darkness comprehended it not. Comprehended it mean, meaning it couldn't overcome the light. And darkness cannot overcome light. The smallest amount of light will penetrate the deepest amount of darkness. Jesus came into the world, and the darkness couldn't hold back his light. It couldn't assuage his influence, if you will. Now we come then, go on over to chapter 3, and John continually comes back to this theme of the light. And so in John chapter 3, in verse number 18, he talks about man's response to Jesus when he came. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So you don't have to do it. You don't have to do anything to be lost except to not believe. He is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Son of God. And this is the condemnation that rests upon this world, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, and neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You see, wherever there's evil, it has to hide. It has to cloak itself in darkness. Think, if you will, of the People's Republic of North Korea, the most secretive nation on the earth today. And Kim, the fellow that our president has negotiated with, and everything is so secretive. Everything is hidden in darkness. It's cloaked. If the light were ever to come on in North Korea, there would be an uprising. And so evil always seeks the cloak of darkness without fail. And so Jesus came. When he said, I'm the light, think with me about this for just a moment, if you will. When Jesus said, I'm the light, here's what he really was saying. He said, I am the revealer of reality. I am the revealer of reality. You turn the light on, it reveals reality. Sometimes I've come in this building, oh, this place is black when there's nobody in here and no lights on. And a time or two, I found myself up here on the platform or down there trying to get up on the platform, and it's so dark. And I wait for my eyes to change, but they didn't change enough. And I would feel my way up. And then I finally figured out my phone has a light on it. And so I pop that phone, and you know what? It reveals the truth, the truth of where that step is, the truth that there's another step in front of it, the truth that there's a speaker that I better avoid hiding in the darkness. Light reveals truth. And when Jesus said, I am the light, what was he saying? I will show you the truth. I'll show you the, about, the truth about God. I'll show you the truth about yourself. I'll show you the truth about other people. Jesus brought us the understanding of God. I have people say to me fairly often, Pastor, what is God like? And I finally found a great simple answer that everybody seems to grasp. What is God like? He's like Jesus. Look no further. Get your Bible and start reading the Gospels. You know what God's like? He's like Jesus. If you want to know what God is, then look to Jesus because the Lord Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. And He came to reveal who God is, what God is like, the character of God, the thoughts of God. 
He not only revealed us the truth about God, he reveals to us the truth about ourselves. Do you know why? Do you know why I do what I do? Well, I can look to the teachings of Jesus Christ and it'll explain it. Why I am like I am, why my motivations are like they are, my thoughts are like they are, the problems that I have. Jesus Christ came to reveal truth. Don't ever let anybody talk you out of that today. Because you know what the other option is? There isn't one. There isn't one. If you miss it with Jesus Christ, you've missed it. Because there's no one else I know that even ever claimed to be the truth. Light appears to be so simple, doesn't it? I look up here, these bright lights. It's really one of the most complex things on the earth. Jesus Christ, his teaching is so simple, the little child can understand. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Such is the kingdom of God. So simple. And yet that light is so complex. You ever driving down in your car and it's been a big rain and the air is full of humidity and mist and and a rainbow appears. And that water is like a prism. And it separates the colors of the, of the spectrum of light. You know why that red flower right there is red? It's red because whatever it is in that flower, it absorbs all the colors of the, of the spectrum except the red, and that's reflected back. Do you know why that one's yellow? Same thing. Every color is absorbed except when you look at a color, all the other colors are absorbed by the nature of whatever you're looking at. Now, that's pretty complex, isn't it? I can't figure that out. And you know what? Jesus Christ appeared to be so simple, so obvious what he was saying, and yet people have been studying his words For 2,100 years, the depth of them is absolutely beyond human comprehension. Simple, and yet the explanation for everything. I don't need to labor with this to make my point. The world is a dark place today, folks. I hear people say all the time, well, things really haven't changed. No, really, things have changed. It's a naive statement. They haven't changed. Oh, there's always been some degree. 50 people dead in New Zealand because of a madman. All across America now, we're finding out that wealthy people and celebrities paid big sums of money and cheated to get people to take the SAT score or the SAT uh, test for their, for their children. Everything is corrupted virtually in our whole culture today. I mean, you thought that you would get, uh, you, you could gain entrance to college by sitting down and studying hard and working and taking the SAT test and you have a pretty good chance. Found out sometimes has nothing to do with it. Somebody has more money, they pay the way in. The girl on the news last night said, I'm not interested in going to college. I don't want to learn anything. I want to party. I'll get somebody to take the test for me. Corruption, darkness, evil. England today in a chaos because the people voted two years ago to leave the Commonwealth, the European Commonwealth, and guess what? The politicians won't let them do what they are supposed to be able to vote a way to do. Sounds like Washington. Forty-eight percent of our young people want socialism? Young person. Go to Venezuela or Cuba for six months, and then come back and tell me you want it. 
That's ignorance. And we've rejected the light. We've rejected the one who reveals truth. John Hancock, the man with the prominent signature on the Declaration of Independence. Back in the colonial days, John Hancock went one night to hear John Witherspoon, who also signed the Declaration. John Witherspoon was the outstanding colonial preacher. Witherspoon is known, great theologian, great preacher, had a great ministry. And he preached on my text of this morning, John 8, 12, and 9, 5. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And uh, Hancock was perplexed. He said, I really don't understand what John Witherspoon was trying to say. I, I, I'm confused. He got on his horse, and he rode to his home about four or five miles distant, and it was a pitch black night. He said, there was no moon, no stars. It was just very, very dark. He came to his home, put his horse in the barn, pulled out his key, walked on the front porch, inserted the key, turned it in the lock, opened the door, and walked in. And when he walked in, he said, I've got it. I see. His wife said, John, sure you see. You just came in from the dark. He said, no, 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 no. I went to hear Brother Witherspoon tonight, and I understand what he was saying. Faith is the key. Jesus is the door. Faith opens the door, and you see the light. I'd say he got it, wouldn't you? I'd say he got it that night. My question to you is this. Is there anybody here today who wants to come in out of the darkness? Is there anybody watching today our program on television and you want to come in out of the darkness? Jesus is the light. Come to the cross. Come to Jesus and you'll see the light. Stand with me, if you will, to your feet, please.